Hello everyone and welcome to another video. So today we are on to week three of our AE511 journey into classical control theory. So with that being said, let's go ahead and jump into the roadmap to see where we're headed this week. So um, the first discussion and video this week is uh, a little bit of a follow up from last week. So remember last week in week two, we started looking at some uh, performance metrics for first and second order systems. And we looked at deriving some analytical expressions of um, how you could pre make these predictions of these performance metrics if you knew something about the system. Well now, let's say you have a higher order system or a more complicated linear system. There are other tools in MATLAB, namely the Linear System Analyzer. It's a tool in MATLAB that's going to allow you to analyze these types of performance metrics as well. So this first video is just following up and looking at how we can get a computer tool in MATLAB to do that type of analysis. And with that out of the way, now what I'd like to start looking at is um, we've got these three videos here, which now all deal with different types of models of uh, linear dynamic systems. So earlier, so far, what we've been looking at is mostly a transfer function model, correct? And you probably remember from our AE501 class, do you remember when we talked a little bit about state space representations of ordinary differential equations. So this is a video we watched, uh, well, you watched this in AE501, so I know since that was a prerequisite, everyone remembers this. Well, you might not remember, so feel free to brush up if you want to refresh your memory on what a state space representation is. But now what I'd like to do is talk about, okay, how do we go from a state space representation to a transfer function? That's this first video. And then the next video is just the opposite direction. If someone gives you a transfer function, how can you turn that into a state space. And then lastly, at this point, now we've got three different models. We've got a, uh, everything starts usually from a set of linear ordinary differential equations, right? Then we talked about how to get a state space representation. Now we talked about how to get a transfer function representation. And now we know how to go between all these. So this last video right here is just a very quick summary of how to go between all of these three different types of uh, linear models of a dynamic system. Okay, so then what I like to do is we are going to get a little bit of a jump start on week four. So week four, we are going to start looking at frequency domain analysis. So what I want to tack on at the end of this week is what is frequency domain analysis? Um, long story short, little spoiler alert, a lot of these performance metrics we were talking about earlier here, these were uh, referred to as time domain analysis because we were hitting the system with an input step function. And then we were looking at how the response varied with time, right? We would want to see, does the system overshoot? Does it eventually settle out? Things like that. Well, now if we want to talk instead about frequency domain analysis, now we might be asking ourselves questions about what happens if you subjected this system to a sinusoidal input of varying frequency? And instead of looking at time as the independent variable, maybe we're going to start looking at frequency as the independent variable. And again, I think this video will hopefully make that a little bit more clear of what we're talking about. So that's the roadmap for this week. Um, why don't we go ahead and take a look at uh, the homework to see how some of this is uh, reflected. All right, so let me pull up the homework here on the other side. Okay, so uh, let's just jump right into it. So the first problem is actually kind of fun. Um, has anyone seen the movie Top Gun? <laughs> um, I don't mean Maverick. I don't mean the new version of Top Gun. I mean the original Top Gun. Um, in that movie, if you watch the beginning of the movie, the intro, in fact, here's the link to the video on YouTube. I don't want to play it right here because I don't want to get a copyright strike. But um, you'll see that there's a sequence of having an F-14 launch off the deck of an aircraft carrier. Well, I thought it might be fun to see if we can make a very simple model of this in Simulink. So this here, I'm going to say is part A is let, let's assume that the engines on this aircraft they have some kind of dynamic response, meaning that if you command a throttle position or a, an engine setting, the force that the engine produces is not instantaneous, right? It's going to take some time to ramp up. So let's model it using a transfer function right here. So this is the transfer function between how the engine force responds to the throttle position of the, uh, of the, of the engine, okay? So um, basically part A is just do a little bit of analysis of this, right? Get a rough feel of what does this mean? Does it go slow? Does it go fast? Is there overshoot? What, what happens when the pilot or the operator of the F-14 decides to, to command a throttle? What does the engine force do? Similarly, the engine is not the only thing that's pushing the aircraft down the, uh, down the deck of the aircraft carrier. There's also a catapult. Right? Let's assume the catapult force looks like this, right? So again, this is the actual catapult force to the commanded force setting. 
So again, same thing, just get a feel for what does this catapult force look like. And then for part C, let's go ahead and make about the simplest free body diagram you can of an F-14. Let's take this F-14 and just assume it's a brick, assume it's a rigid mass, but there's some aerodynamic drag on it, meaning the faster this thing goes, there is a larger and larger aerodynamic drag force that slows it down. Let's just use a really simple drag model. This is just simple linear viscous drag right here. Um, and just do that. So with that information, you should probably be able to get transfer functions of how does the force, again, this force here is the total force on this body, right? In this case, it's going to be the sum of the engine and the catapult, but in the, from just a free body diagram perspective, just think about this U, it's just the net force, uh, uh, propulsive force on the aircraft. Then you have a drag force slowing you down. So again, you should be able to get these transfer functions of how does the position of the aircraft respond to an input force and how does the velocity of the aircraft respond to an input force. So get these two transfer functions and derive them. And then what we can do is once we have these two transfer functions in mind, let's go ahead and make some side or parallel calculations. Namely, I wanna know as this aircraft is starting to hurdle down the uh, aircraft carrier deck, how is the lift changing? So the lift, let's use a really simple lift model. Lift is just gonna be the dynamic pressure, right? One half rho v squared times some constant coefficient of lift times the wing area. And again, I'll just give you some, some numbers right here that we can basically play with, okay? So you can think about this as what's happening is we're gonna, we're gonna start the vehicle from the end of the runway at rest. Then we are gonna slam on the engine, slam on the catapult. We wanna start it hurtling down the, down the deck. The lift is going to start increasing and increasing and increasing as the velocity increases and increases and increases. And I want to just now build a Simulink model that's going to solve all of this for me. So I don't want to have to calculate this analytically. I want to go ahead and have a Simulink uh, system that's doing this. So that's what this part is basically doing. It's just modeling this system as a rigid body, uh, applying some forces, and then building a Simulink model. So now let's finally in part E, let's go ahead and see what does this thing actually do. So uh, I'll give you some numbers for uh, an aircraft carrier deck. And in this first part, what we're gonna assume is that the aircraft is sitting at idle, like the engines are sitting at zero. And then suddenly you're given a launch command the catapult snaps, um, the, the catapult force, you know, goes, for, uh, or the commanded catapult position goes from zero to one, and the commanded throttle of the aircraft goes from zero to one. And is, it, is this going to work? Can the aircraft get off the aircraft carrier deck in time? Basically, at the end of the runway, is the lift greater than the weight of the, of the aircraft, okay? And again, this is probably not the best way to do this, right? Instead, instead of, um, suddenly turning on the engines when you want to go. What you probably want to do is you probably want to have the engine spooled up ahead of time, right, to full power, and then you start your launch sequence. So part F is just looking at what is the difference? Do, do, do you see any difference in these two scenarios? Can you modify your Simulink model to basically simulate both part E and part F, and then use it just to compare and contrast? So I think this is a fun problem, um, gets a little bit more experience with Simulink and uh, allows us to incorporate some transfer functions and some dynamic models with some parallel calculations in mind. Okay, so that's problem one. Um, let's take a look at problem two. Problem two is kind of interesting. So in problem two, what I'm asking you to do is to uh, basically write three of your own custom MATLAB functions. What these functions do is you give me a vector of timestamps and a vector of signals and what this first function is going to do is it's going to examine that data and it's going to calculate the percent overshoot um, that is represented in this signal, right? The second one is also is going to be similar, but now it's going to calculate the, the, the settling time, right? And you probably got to give it one more parameter, right? You got to tell it what delta amount of settling are you looking for? And then the last one is it's going to calculate the rise time. And now you might need to tell it what percentage do you want to start at and what percentage do you want to stop at to consider the system going uh, risen completely. So these are just generic functions. So our previous discussion here, right, if you remember, this had the assumption that you have a linear system, right? So if you have a linear second order system, you could figure out what the percent overshoot, the settling time, or other performance metrics of this are. But what if these traces of data were coming from a flight test? Say you've got an aircraft flying around and you do something and, and you do some kind of maneuver and you want to analyze the percent overshoot. Well, you're only going to get traces of data. You're not going to get um, a linear system model 
All right, so I want you to write these functions so that you can give it just generic traces of data and it will calculate these. And when I say generic, it doesn't have to be completely generic. You can assume maybe that these signals are reasonable in the sense that they start flat, maybe then they, they respond and then they end flat. You know, feel free to make a, a very simple assumption like that. Um, and just make sure you document that in your function so that a user of your function knows how it works and knows what the assumptions are when they're calling your function. But again, all you're doing for problem two is you're writing these three functions. So you're starting your own little library of functions that you can use for control theory and analysis. And then you're just gonna hide this and store this and we're gonna use this actually in problem three. So the deliverable for problem two, there really isn't a deliverable. You don't have to, to screenshot your code or anything like that. Just feel free to, to write down, hey, problem two, I I did write these three functions. You're gonna see evidence of me using that in the very next problem. So let's talk about problem three because that's what we're gonna do. Problem three here is I would like to consider a transfer function that looks like this. In fact, let me zoom this in maybe a little bit so we can see this a little bit more easily. Okay, so you can see this is actually, it's a third order system, right? There are three poles. So you can't actually use these results we derived earlier in some of our previous discussions, right? These assume a second order system. This is a third order system. So now the question becomes, well, this is third pole is really messing up our math, right? If this thing were not here, I would have a nice second order system. Well, tell you what, why don't we do that? Let's make an approximation, let's call it G tilde, where I'm just gonna neglect this third pole. And now what I want to look at in this problem is, is it a safe assumption to neglect the third pole or not? Does the system behave differently if you have that third pole or not? And the way we're gonna characterize differently is, Things like the percent overshoot, the settling time, the rise time. Do these performance metrics change if you have or have not, uh, or if this poll is present or is not present? And furthermore, not just if it's present or if it's not present, but what does this value P3 do to it? Right? You can see that this P3 value, it's changing the poll location of this third poll. So what we're looking for in the rest of this problem, I'll let you read through the actual verbiage, um, but in a very high level, I'd like to look at what happens if you vary these numbers uh, of the P3. What does that actually mean? How do the poles and zeros of the overall system change as this P3 number varies between these, these, I guess it's one, two, three, four numbers, right? So part E is just make yourself a pole zero map of how G and G tilde change as P3 changes. And then for part F, we are gonna go ahead and use your code from problem two and fill in this plot. So basically make yourself a little plot of how does a percent overshoot versus the P3 value change? How does the settling time and the rise time change as the P3 value changes? And then lastly, just make some conclusions on when is it safe or not to ignore that third pole, okay? All right. So with that being said, I think that's pretty much where we're going. Um, I don't think I have too much else to say on this other than um, some of this is going to come back and we are, are gonna potentially use this in some future discussions. So uh, keep that in mind. We're priming the pump for some of this uh, downstream uh, discussions and lectures, but otherwise, um, this is probably a good spot to leave it. Why don't um, I just go ahead and cut this off now and if you have any questions, just feel free to email me and I hope to see people in office hours. All right, thanks everyone, bye.